My friends, it's Friday evening. We're just sitting here quietly. Jan's doing something over in her chair, and I'm... I read this earlier. Might have been yesterday. I don't remember, but I thought, you know, this deserves some time and attention. I'm reading from the book, um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 195 to 220, somewhere in there. I'm using uh, EPUB, which allows me to make the type get larger or smaller. Here, I'll show you. Oh, can't do it because I'm in the record mode. Anyway, allows me to do some highlighting. It's about Jacob's trouble. Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God must pass just before Christ's second coming. The prophet Jeremiah in holy vision looking down to this time said, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 5 to 7. Jacob's trouble. The earlier part of this chapter in the book uh, Patriarchs and Prophets talks about Jacob as he was on his way Back, God had directed him to leave Laban to take his family and head back home. And this would mean he would encounter Esau, his brother, from whom he had stolen the birthright. And with the birthright came a double portion of the father's uh, inheritance or the inheritance from the father. And uh, this could stir up Esau because Jacob had stolen the birthright through deceit. And we learn that Esau was marching toward him with 400 men. He did not want to lose his inheritance and he was not happy with Jacob. Well, so this is the background. And Jacob splits up his family, sends half one way, half another way. And then he crosses over the river or the stream, and there it is that he pours his heart out in prayer. There it is that he meets the angel of the Lord with a capital A, Christ himself, in angel form, and he wrestled. If you don't know that story, look it up in the book of Genesis. Exodus, Genesis. Okay, now I'm having a brain uh, brain freeze. Anyway, huh? It is Genesis. Yeah, that's right. We read on. When Christ, right here, when Christ shall cease his work as mediator in man's behalf, then this time of trouble will begin. Which time of trouble? It's that one mentioned up here, the time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, mentioned in Jeremiah 30, verse 5 to 7. You will recall various times when the children of Israel faced times of trouble. When they were in captivity, the law was made uh, that the Jews, children of Israel, could be destroyed and their property taken from them. A death decree was issued and Esther went before the king, Ahasuerus, and you know that story. And the Lord delivered them. And then we think of the three worthies that were cast into the burning, fiery furnace. They were required to bow down and worship the golden image. And Jesus appeared in the fire with them and delivered them. Whereas the strong soldiers who cast them into the burning fiery furnace dropped dead from the heat of getting close enough to toss the three worthies in. So, we can see various times in history. And now, Jeremiah 30 verse 5 to 7 speaks of a time of 
Jacob's trouble. When Christ shall cease his work as mediator in man's behalf, then this time of, a time of trouble will begin. Then the case of every soul will have been decided. Okay? The case of every soul will have been decided. And there will be no atoning blood to cleanse from sin. When Jesus leaves his position as man's intercessor before God, the solemn announcement is made. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. This is found in Revelation 22, verse 11. We read on. Then the restraining Spirit of God is withdrawn from the earth. As Jacob was threatened with death by his angry brother, so the people of God will be in peril from the wicked who are seeking to destroy them. And as the patriarch wrestled all night for deliverance from the hand of Esau, his brother, so the righteous will cry to God day and night for deliverance from the enemies that surround them. Satan had accused Jacob before the angels of God, claiming the right to destroy him because of his sin. He had moved upon Esau, Satan had, to march against him, Jacob, and during the patriarch's long night of wrestling, Satan endeavored to force upon him, Jacob, a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and break his hold upon God. When in his distress Jacob laid hold of the angel, capital A, and made supplication with tears, the heavenly messenger, capital M, in order to try his faith, Jacob's, also reminded him of his sin and endeavored to escape from him. But Jacob would not be turned away. He had learned that God is merciful. And he cast himself upon his mercy. He pointed back to his repentance for his sin and pleaded for deliverance. As he reviewed his life, he was driven almost to despair. But he held fast the angel, capital A, meaning Jesus, and with earnest, agonizing cries, urged his petition upon until he prevailed. Jacob reviewed his life. He was not happy knowing how he had lived his life. He was driven almost to despair, but he petitioned Jesus until he prevailed. Such will be the experience of God's people in their final struggle with the powers of evil. God will test their faith, their perseverance, their confidence in his power to deliver them. Satan will endeavor to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that their sins have been too great to receive pardon. They will have a deep sense of their shortcomings, and as they review their lives, their hopes will sink. But 
remembering the greatness of God's mercy and their own sincere repentance. Remembering the greatness of God's mercy and their own sincere repentance. They will plead His promises made through Christ to helpless, repenting sinners. Their faith will not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. They will lay hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel and the language of their souls will be, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. O oh Lord Jesus, I need your blessing. Yes, I know my past, but I have confessed my sins to you. And you have promised that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just. And you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Claiming the promises. We read on. Had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud. God could not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them. While tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. If what? if the people of God had unconfessed sins. We read on. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they will have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins will have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ and they cannot bring them to remembrance. They know that they're unworthy. This is us, God's people in the last days. We will know that we are unworthy. But if we have no concealed wrongs to reveal, so in other words, we're not concealing any wrongs, if we know our sins have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ, then we cannot bring those past deeds to remembrance at that time. We read on, Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But the Lord shows in his dealing with Jacob that he can in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven unconfessed and unforgiven will be overcome by Satan. What have we learned? If we confess our sins, Jesus takes care of removing them from us. He not only forgives us, he cleanses us. And that Greek word cleanses has to do with healing. As in the word salvation, a salve being applied, a cleansing agent, the blood of Jesus. If we confess our sins, if we say, however, oh, my sins aren't that bad. Oh, what I, if that's the way I am. Oh, my friend, no matter what sin you have, no matter what temptation you are inclined to give in to, ask Jesus and he will bless you. We can be overcome-ers. 
I'll read it again. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven unconfessed and unforgiven will be overcome by Satan. The more exalted their position and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God and the more certain the triumph of the great adversary. Yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin, but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus it will be with those who live in the last days. As dangers surround them and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. We can do nothing of ourselves. In all our helpless unworthiness, we must trust in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. None will ever perish while they do this. Do what? In all our helpless unworthiness, we must trust in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. So we confess all our sins. As the Holy Spirit brings them to our remembrance, we confess them, we forsake them. But we will not be able to stand there based on our own merits. It's trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. None will ever perish while they do this. The long black catalog of our delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. But he who listens to the cries of his servants of old will hear the prayer of faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised, and he will fulfill his word. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His experience testifies to the power of importunate prayer. It is now that we are to learn this lesson of prevailing prayer, of unyielding faith. The greatest victories to the church of Christ or to the individual Christian are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God, with earnest, agonizing faith, lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Those who are unwilling to forsake every sin, those who are unwilling to forsake every sin and to seek earnestly for God's blessing, will not obtain it. But all who will lay hold of God's promises as did Jacob and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. Shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him though he bear long with them? I tell you, that he will avenge them speedily. Luke 18, 7 and 8. That's the end of this quotation. As we're reading it here, my heart is filled with courage. I am reminded of God's blessings, his promise. Our part is to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
My friend, may God bless you as you do just that.